Merry Christmas. May God be with you. Good morning, the day after. Um, it is good to see all of you who are here in the sanctuary and for all of you who are online as well. Um, if it feels like you were just here, that's true. On this weekend where um, here we are again on Sunday in the season of Christmas. And thank you, um, top shelf musicians for being here uh, today again and for our tech crew and I'm really grateful uh, to be joined by Allison Nahr. Allison has her um, Master's of Arts from Children, Youth, and Family at Luther Seminary and uh, she is a strong one on our bench um, as a preacher and Allison thank you for being here today. Um, it's good to be with you and we look forward uh, to this ongoing story of um, Jesus coming into the world and uh, now Luke continues when Jesus was a little kid and he hung out in church a little bit longer than his parents thought so we're going to hear more about that today so wherever today finds you we're glad uh, to be with you and trust always in how God is alive and moving in this world um, God's spirit among us. So with that, um, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing angels we, from the realms of glory. We pray together, O oh God, shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom and open our minds to hear your word. Call us to go and tell what is made known through your love. Now every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, 
Your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But then they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm Allison Nahr, a member here at Mount Olivet. Thank you, Pastor Beth, for inviting me to preach today. Um, today we heard about a tween Jesus in our scripture reading. And how can he be a tween already? It feels like yesterday he was born. Oh, come on. Come on, this is the only time I ever can use that line here at this pulpit. Okay. Ours is a culture that loves questions. Questions show up all around us in songs, in movies, in advertising, in literature. How many of the following questions do you recognize? You talking to me? Who you gonna call? Do you wanna build a snowman? Do you hear what I hear? How many roads must a man walk down before they call him a man? Who's on first? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day Wherefore art thou Romeo? Can you hear me now? What would you do for a Klondike bar? What's in your wallet? Questions invade our world. I have to confess, I am addicted to watching Jeopardy at 4.30 every weekday. What makes Jeopardy such a compelling show to watch is that it tips the whole question-answer formula on its head by giving answers as a question and then asking a question for the answer. Job interviews are questions. Students take standardized tests of questions. When we meet someone, we start with a question. How do you do? Store employees ask us, can I help you find something? Servers ask us, does everything taste okay? If you've ever spent time around a three-year-old, you will have been asked, why? Have you ever played questions not 20 questions, I know you've played that, but questions. I used to play this with my youth group all the time. You might have seen something like it on whose line it is it anyway, another question. The rules are quite basic. You have to answer a question with a question. A point is awarded to the other player if you answer the question, hesitate too long before responding, repeat a question or answer with an unrelated or hypothetical question. Here's an example. Want to play a game? What game? How about questions? How do you play? Don't you know how to play questions? How would I know how to play if I've never done it before? You get the idea. It's deceptive because it seems so easy at first. How hard is it to ask questions? Questions just roll off our tongues, often with little thought behind them. And that's the rub with this game. You actually have to think but you're thinking about a question, not an answer. And our brains aren't trained that way. We are trained to answer a question that is asked. We are trained that if we ask a question, we'll receive an answer that imparts knowledge or information that helps us learn something we did not know before. Yet every time we played this game, there were lots and lots of questions being asked, but very little learning going on. Today's scripture lesson, the story of boy Jesus in the temple, reminded me of this game. Did you see it there, right in the middle? Upon finally finding Jesus after three days of him being out of her sight, Mary's first words to Jesus were a question. Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. When Mary entered the temple, she didn't see the Messiah. She saw her boy, the one the angel announced she would bear, the one she bore in a stable, the one she fled with to Egypt to avoid his being killed. No wonder she asked what she did. Pay attention here to Jesus' response. It's really important. His words are remarkable. Did you know 
that these are the earliest recorded words of Jesus in the Bible? Other than the birth story from yesterday, this story, which occurs only in Luke, is the singular insight we have into Jesus' life before his baptism as an adult. But it isn't just the fact that these are his earliest words that makes his response so interesting. Look at what's happening here. He's 12 years old and clearly a faithful Jew having been raised by faithful parents who regularly go to Jerusalem to observe the festivals. He's a responsible enough boy that his parents weren't concerned that he wasn't at their side while traveling for a full day. Remember that traditionally at age 13, a Jewish boy celebrates his bar mitzvah, which is a coming of age ceremony that recognizes that he is ready to be accountable for his actions and bear responsibility for Jewish ritual, law, and tradition. He will be considered an adult then. For now, he's still a child whose parents bear responsibility of his actions. Look at Mary's words more carefully, your father and I. Here she's referring to Joseph, her husband, the carpenter. The passage even refers to Mary and Joseph as Jesus' parents. Then Jesus turns everything upside down, saying he must be in his father's house. Capital F, Father being God. Now we're faced with two Jesuses, Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph, who is becoming known as Jesus, son of God. We have discovered for the first time a different understanding of who Jesus' father is. That's major. And it's easy to miss because it's wrapped up in yet another fascinating fact. Jesus responds to his mother not with an answer, but with questions. Did you notice that? Why were you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? At first glance, I admit the mom in me gets a little triggered at what looks like a lippy response from a rebellious tween. After all, I have a teenage boy of my own, and having your question answered with a question is often a stalling tactic or an evasive maneuver to get out of an admission of guilt. But what we have here is not at all a rebellious, sassy, or even guilty smart aleck. I don't see Jesus' questions as defensive or snarky. I see his questions as true wonderment. I think Jesus was genuinely surprised that it hadn't occurred to his parents that he'd be in the temple. Didn't they know who he was? Was that whole thing with the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and the gold and frankincense and myrrh? Did we forget all that? Perhaps Jesus was thinking if they just paused to think about who he was, then they'd know where to find him. When we can't find something, we look in the most obvious place for it to be. If I lose my car keys, I don't go to the freezer to look for them. I start by checking my pockets, and then I check my purse again, and maybe I'll check the countertop or even in the car itself. And I think that's what's behind Jesus' questions. Why weren't you looking for me in the most obvious place? Based on who I am and why we were in Jerusalem in the first place, it should be easy to find me. And that's what shows up so prominently for me in this story, that it isn't a story about negligent parents who can't keep track of their child, who also happens to be the Messiah. And it isn't a story about a disobedient child who is hiding from his parents. No, when I read it, I see this is a story about questions. If you look up earlier in the passage, you'll see we're told Jesus was in the temple with the teachers of the law, listening to them and asking questions. This text is sometimes misinterpreted that Jesus is teaching the teachers. In order to understand this verse, you need to understand rabbinical teaching. The rabbinical style of teaching uses questions on the part of the students from which discussions would arise. Jesus had not already mastered the law and was now imparting it to the teachers. No, he was asking questions to learn. Judaism is a religion of questions. It is seen as religious duty to teach children to ask questions. That is how they grow. I read that some Jewish mothers don't ask their children 
what did you learn today when they come home from school? Instead, they ask, did you ask a good question today? When it, questions are highly valued and a big part of passing on the faith. And we would do well to remember that it isn't just the Jews who ask questions for understanding. Luther wrote the small catechism to be used in the home by parents to teach their children the faith. A catechism is just a series of questions with answers to be memorized. But long before Luther, there was the Manishtana. Do you know what that is, the Manishtana? It comes from the Jewish observation of the Passover Seder. It all starts with a question by the youngest child and is translated to, why is tonight different from all other nights? This phrase is repeated at the start of each of what is called the four questions, which highlight the ways in which Passover customs and food distinguish the holiday from the rest of the year. Many of the customs that have developed around the four questions are designed to fulfill the obligation to tell the story to one's children. So you see, the Passover Seder is more a forum for education than a festival of commemoration. The Seder plate isn't actually the focus. The children are. Their questions and their learning. Now, Jesus and his family were in Jerusalem to observe Passover. So this ceremony would not only be familiar to him, but fresh in his mind. And I'm just going to bring you down a little rabbit trail just for a moment. This is another interesting note about this story, not related to questions, but related to Passover. I want you to notice that here we have Jesus in Jerusalem for the Passover, in the temple, keeping company with the teachers of the law, the very people who two decades later, when he is again in Jerusalem for the Passover, have him tried, convicted, and put to death. And he is gone for three days. You connect the dots. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, read the last three chapters of Luke or come talk to me after service. Okay, back to questions. These questions that inspire discussion and learning are the kinds of questions that Jesus was asking that were astounding the teachers in the temple. We don't know exactly what questions he asked in the temple that day, but we do know that Jesus goes on to ask a lot of questions throughout his life. Hundreds of questions. Questions like, who touched my clothes? If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? What do you want me to do for you? What are you looking for? Why are you so afraid? Do you love me? Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? Not every question has an answer we can understand. Not all questions even have answers or need one. Some questions lead to knowledge. Some lead to understanding. There's a difference. Jesus' questions are often the latter. Jesus' question, the questions that Jesus asks aren't ever neutral. They cause us to wake up. They stir up a response in us. They force us to look within and reflect and be transformed. And for this reason, I love Jesus' questions. And there are times for this reason, I don't. He challenges us with those questions of his. You of little faith, why do you doubt? Who do you say that I am? Where is your faith? Oh, those, those questions sting sometimes. They force me to face some tough stuff about myself, but they also help bring me back to him. But being asked a question is very different from asking questions, and I want to focus on asking questions. I'm going to tell you something. Asking a question is really brave. It is an admission that there is some lack on your part. There's an empty space to be filled something you don't know that another person does. Admitting that can be hard. I'm sure you can think of at least one example in your life where you were too shy or too embarrassed to ask a question. Had you simply asked 
things would have gone smoother or more quickly or had been over before it got worse. Sometimes we don't ask a question because we simply don't know what we don't know. And sometimes we don't ask because we're afraid of what the answer could be. But asking questions is one of the best things that we can do. Mary asked a tough question of Jesus, and that in turn gives us an example and permission to ask tough questions of Jesus. Her question is one we ask sometimes in our lives. Why have you treated us like this? We've all had our tough seasons, haven't we? When things keep going wrong, when the job layoff comes, when the car won't start, when the divorce gets finalized, when the diagnosis really is cancer, when your college application gets rejected, or when you just can't catch a break. When things are hard and scary and unknown, we want to ask God, why have you treated us like this, God? It runs through our minds, and we can feel afraid to ask it. What if God doesn't like that question? What if it makes God angry that I ask that? When it comes to our faith, we often have very big questions, which we think require very big answers. Questions we sometimes think are too big even for God to answer. Well, I've got news for you. God can handle your questions, even your tough ones, especially your tough ones. So go ahead and ask it. Even Jesus asked God a tough question, his last one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But remember, not every question has an answer you can understand. That's where the faith part comes in. A rabbi once said, we are closer to God when we are asking questions than when we think we have the answers. Some questions don't have answers in this lifetime, period. There are some things we will never fully understand. So I'm not here to give you answers. That's not my role or my work to do. But I am here to remind you and give you permission to ask questions. Continue to seek knowledge and understanding, not answers. The wise person isn't the one who knows but the one who wants to know. Amen. Ready? And. After hearing God's word, we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear friends online, we invite you to share the peace in your comments as we connect with you there, wherever today finds you. And for all of us um, who are here today as well, for us uh, to be able to greet each other and both share and receive peace. And so as we share and receive peace, we also um, will collect our offering. And now may the peace of God be with you all. Let's both share and receive peace from each other. What do you say about a saxophone and a French horn on December 26? Yes, all of you musicians, so beautiful. Thank you so much. God of peace, please join me. Your birth among us is good news of great joy for all people. Turn our hearts towards each other so that we might love our neighbors and share what we have with those in need. Amen.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me gathered online and in on person, united by the Spirit, we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you at home today, um, hear this um, as you use the bread and the wine uh, that you find near to you. The body of Christ is given for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. Um, and always an opening in this meal. Um, it's not about press lines in our faith, but it, the bumps in the road and the questions. And that's what I love about our Lutheran theology is that we can bring those questions to Scripture um, and trust it's not necessarily an answer, but this ongoing conversation with God who chooses to be in relationship with us. So whatever that question is that you're holding on your heart today, bring it up front, open your hands, and receive this gift of grace, forgiveness, and presence in your life in the community together. So for those of us at church, Ellison and I will be serving you today. Feel free to come up the center aisle. Um, the cracker, the wafer is gluten-free, and then uh, the wine is dark red, and the grape juice is a lighter color. So please come forth. The feast is prepared.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. So, um, we have more people online today than we do in church. I love the way that this switches every week. Um, this unfolding story, this re-emerging in the midst of an ongoing um, pandemic here. Um, but we pray together. And uh, for those of you who are online, I just invite you to type your prayers in the comments. And um, I will read those and join you in your prayers. And all of us here, if you have a prayer, simply uh, just raise your hand and I will come close and speak that on your behalf. And it's okay to pray a question today. Thank you, Allison, for reminding us of that. It's not that we come with prayers figured out ever, um, but really um, questioning God's presence and inviting God into that. And the response often uh, comes through us as a community together, showing up for people in their lives, offering what we have. So uh, this story continues. Uh, to be real and true in our lives as well. So I'll start us off, and then I just invite you, um, comment in the prayers, and for those of you here, just raise your hand, and I will come close to you there. So let's pray. Um, God, today, uh, for Christmas, uh, this season uh, that's still upon us, uh, for um, us just to take in where you are in this world, um, it is not a story of only joy. It's a joy that is found in the sadness as well, God. And for a sense of presence for what this world needs, um, we pray especially ongoing inequality and injustice in the world. Why do some people have so much and others are struggling just to make it? Uh, we pray especially for those uh, people in places um, looking for work, um, looking for that next thing to provide for their family, for addiction, for mental health, uh, for the, the darkness of this season in the Northern Hemisphere that reminds us that we all need hope and light and activity in our lives and a purpose. Uh, for your ongoing story and for us to gather to hear that today. And now, God, hear the prayers that we have together. God, in your mercy. Okay, friends online, you keep typing. I'm going to uh, turn my head towards those who are here first. Mark. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, we've been praying with Mark for his dad. Uh, cancer diagnosis and surgery now, that that surgery went well um, for the days um, I had for your mom and for all of you who are caring for your dad, uh, for him to feel that love coming close to him. Um, and I think you speak that question, the future is unknown, what is next, Mark? You do not know, but you trust in that next thing and for love to come close. And so we continue to accompany you in those prayers of healing and recovery for your dad. God, in your mercy. Surely. Yeah, Dan Coffin uh, passed away uh, this morning um, after a diagnosis of brain cancer last February, and it has been such a tough road. And uh, for Christy now, um, in Dan's death, for the next things, uh, we will keep you posted as Funeral arrangements are made for a funeral here at Mount Olivet um, and keep you posted on that. And I will also keep you posted on how Christy can use love and support in the days ahead as well. Um, God, for a love um, which brain cancer can't even separate us from and not even death, um, but the ache and pain of losing uh, your life partner and spouse, um, for uh, this road over the last year that has been most difficult. We also speak for the way that love has come in and light has come in. Uh, for what Christy um, needs in the days ahead and for us as a community who love and support her, um, to hold her for Dan's beautiful life, uh, for his contributions, for his marriage vows, 
uh, that he lived out until the end. Um, and um, for all the things that words can't cover in a moment like this, God, uh, breathe and speak into this world and into our lives. God, in your mercy. Oh, Teresa, um, prayers of thanks to God for my sister's brain aneurysm surgery um, is going well. Um, Teresa, we've been praying for that and so glad for the update. Ongoing um, healing and care for your sister um, in that major surgery. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Um, Samantha, I pray for a cousin who tested positive for COVID yesterday and couldn't be at Christmas and hoping she gets better soon. Um, we pray for your cousin, Samantha. Um, so many uh, people around Monolavid who have been diagnosed as of late and need to stay away, uh, both for staff and members in that. Uh, for this ongoing of COVID life that we live, uh, for caregivers, uh, for vaccines, um, for communities, um, in all the ways that we continue to need it, God in your mercy. Uh, Ian, prayers for those who are traveling over the next several days, especially with snow in the forecast. Um, indeed, we pray for uh, safe travel um, over these next days for the New Year's holiday that is upon us yet this week. Um, yeah, prayers of comfort and hope for the families of Dante Wright and Kim and Kim Potter. Uh, Jolyn, we pray um, in the midst of the headlines uh, that we're in and... Um, justice in the world uh, for families uh, for what they need at this moment and for us to c continue the work that we have around uh, racial trauma and racial inequity in this world and for each of us how we are specifically called that way for the work that we continue to be about at Mount Olivet more awareness and engagement in this God in your mercy Uh, Rita, uh, we're praying for the sick and hurt. Pray for healing of body, mind, and spirit. Indeed, we speak that overarching prayer that you have today. Um, God, in your mercy. Other prayers today? Hmm. Yeah, Deb, um, uh, our love goes to you on the death of your Aunt Carol. Um, this week, um, always, but this week especially, a very tender time um, with lots of traditions and remembering and um, just not being able to be together with people as we would like in the midst of what we're experiencing. And so prayers of comfort and love uh, for Carol's life um, in this world and now in death. Uh, we pray for you, God, in your mercy. Um, yeah, Ron, praying that we can develop the practice of questioning our own beliefs, biases, stereotypes, and pers perspectives, truths, and especially that which Jesus is asking. Thank you for that, Ron. Um, that practice of questioning um, what, uh, how we have um, been shaped in our lives and to know that it's an ongoing journey, especially to love God and neighbor. Uh, so may this new year, um, may this next year, may that questioning um, and that ongoing sense of wondering where we are and where other people, people are, uh, where is God, where are we in that as well. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh God, uh, we commend these prayers that we have spoken today, trusting in your mercy and your grace. Amen. Well, I am glad to be with you. Thank you, Allison. Um, Thank you so very much. I think we all have uh, something to uh, ponder and wonder about. And I think that uniqueness of that story, that that's the only written documentation that we have before Jesus' life and ministry um, is quite profound. And, and Luke always, all these people, to be able to bring this message into the world and even Jesus himself as a young person. And to our musicians today, thank you so very much. You've done so much already, and now you're back again. Um, Thomas, you're trending on Facebook. People wondering <laughs> who that was behind the mask on the uh, saxophone. That's Thomas Drummond. So. <laughs> yes, I was like, who's playing saxophone? Yes. 
Um, next week, one service at 10 o'clock again, um, the day after um, New Year's Day, and uh, look forward to being with you. Um, I'm on board for preaching that day, and um, I'm also really happy to announce, I happy uh, announced this on New Year's Eve, or on Christmas Eve, I guess, um, that the church council uh, unanimously approved the candidate that came up as the final candidate, unanimously approved by the call committee. So on January 9th, we will announce publicly who this person is, and that will be the two-week marker to let you know that uh, the church council has called a congregational vote on Sunday, January 23rd at 12.15 here in the sanctuary. That will both be on Zoom and in person. If you're on Zoom, you need to register to be able to vote, and um, a voting member here at Mount Olivet is someone at least in 10th grade um, with um, a record of financial giving to the church over the last year and is worshiping, which of course is online and in on person. So a very exciting way uh, to start this new year and just can't wait uh, to share more as we just finalize some things administratively and um, it's gonna be good, it's very good. And so um, we end this year with um, that hopeful news and begin the next year uh, with two pastors on deck and a lot of things uh, going on here at Mount Olivet, so we're grateful for that. Um, so as we close, I just invite you um, to stand as we sing together, and then I'll leave you with a blessing. Receive the good news of great joy, God's peace descending upon you, God's hope rising around you, and God's love dwelling within you. Be blessed by the God who is born into this world for you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, Christ is born. Thanks be to God. One, two, three.